I'm here to talk to you tonight about reading and writing in a Waldorf school and how we teach it. So like any good answer, it's going to start with a question. So my question to you is to think about your children. I'm assuming you all have children or you know somebody who does and that's why you're here. What's the very first language thing that your child ever did? More things? First language thing your child ever did? Just call it out. Crying. And you get to know. You, you can read their cries. Okay, here we go. So this is an iceberg, and like most icebergs, pretty much most of it's under the water. So the very first thing that most human babies do, well, all of them, I don't think there's any exceptions to this, the first language art, language thing that they do is listening. And after listening, then what do these babies do? Mm, yeah. And what they're listening and they're imitating, they'll coo, they'll cry, gestures and smiling will go along with it. And then after a while, what's the next thing that will start to happen with language with your child? Are you sure? No. <laughs> That's what I say to the children when they ask with seven. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> but you're, uh, you're right on. The next thing that they do is they begin to speak. Speech comes through. Vocalization, speaking, babbling, and along with the vocalization are gestures and smiling and they're imitating your gestures as well. So that's all part of the picture. So listening and speaking are the very first two language arts that the human child engages in. What do you suppose the next thing is? Comprehending. Okay. And that's hugely important. They start to speak. They're listening to you. They're comprehending the world around them. What else? They're getting a little bit older. What do you do? Yeah. They're starting to talk. They're starting to question the world. And what's one of the things that they listen to so often? Every night you probably do this with them. What are they listening to? Stories. Yeah, they're listening to singing. They're listening to stories and they're comprehending it, they're imitating it. What might they want to do with some of those stories? They might want to act them out. They might want to draw them. We're not at the R word yet in, in human development. All right, so the oral tradition in the history of humanity as it goes through the centuries it was an oral tradition. Nothing, nothing, nothing was written. But there were stories, there were songs in the Irish tradition, in the Greek tradition, in South America, in Russia. So after your child's listening to you and speaking to you and doing all of these things, they're putting together a story in their heads. So the next thing that ha what will happen with your child also happen in humanity. If a story is really good enough, somebody wants to preserve that story. If it's worth telling, they want to hand it down. And for the longest time in human history, how were stories handed down? Orally. Orally. And eventually, what did people start to do? What's in the caves in France? 
pictures, pictures, artistic expression is the next thing. And so what your child is going to do is pick up whatever implement of writing is in your home, a crayon, a pen, a marker, piece of charcoal from the fire, and they're going to draw on any available surface, the wall, a piece of paper, their dinner plate. So the next thing in human history and the next thing that children will do is they'll want to start expressing the stories that they've heard. That's the next thing. Artistic expression, gradually, people wanted to preserve these stories. Well, preserving it in sand or on the cave walls got to not be so practical as human civilization began to develop. So and that's where the pictograms came in. So we went from artistic expression and drawings to pictograms, hieroglyphs, and that eventually turned into what? That's right, the alphabet. And then finally, with the alphabet, we were able to take everything that we had heard as stories and preserve it. In a way, we put it to sleep, kind of like when Sleeping Beauty gets put to sleep when it's written down. And we haven't said the R word yet. We're going listening, speaking, artistry, alphabet. And so finally, we come into modern writing. And there are different kinds of alphabets all over the world. Those are the language arts so far. We have something in writing. We've put the stories to sleep. But then we need to wake them up again. What is it that we have to do to writing to wake it up again? Reading. And reading, finally, is up here, above water level. All the rest of this in the iceberg that starts with listening as its basis is underneath the water. You can't tell it's really there. One, two, three, four, and five, six things way before we get to the R word. But in the West, we're in such a rush, we want to go straight for reading. Never mind all this other stuff. Never mind the way human development over centuries has just naturally come about language arts, naturally come about listening, speaking, writing, reading. Listening comes first, speech comes second, writing comes third. Reading is the last language art to come about. So think about the significance of that for instruction, for learning. Do we actually really have to teach a baby to listen and speak? Really, it comes naturally. They learn by imitation. They love to draw. They love to mess around with symbols. They want to write. So writing has to happen before reading. And if you think about it, it just is common sense. You could not possibly read anything if nobody had written it down first. So why in the world do we start teaching at the top of the iceberg and ignore all the rest of this that is clearly obvious to anyone watching a young child engage in language. And every baby learns its mother tongue. It learns to listen to it, it learns to speak it, it wants to express it artistically, and it wants to write it. It wants to. You almost can't stop it. So in the Waldorf School, we take the course of human development through the centuries and the course of child development in the young child's life, and we just flow with the stream. If you're flowing with the stream, it's a lot easier to get where you're going than if you, we just want to start at the top. We just we have to start at the top. We're going to start at the top. And we're never mind with all that other stuff. That's peripheral. And then we wonder why reading doesn't happen. And so the Walter School teaches reading, but we teach it from the bottom up. We teach it the same way that the child naturally learns it, the same way that it happened in human development. And modern brain science, neurology, is starting to explain to us that 
what we know is common sense is actually true in the way that the brain works. So one of the things in this article, there's a, no, it's not in that one. One of the things I want to talk to you out of this book called Smart Moves, Why Learning is Not All in Your Head, by a neurophysiologist named Carla Hannaford. She talks about the eyes and what eyes have to do with reading. And this might surprise you. Little children see peripherally. They don't see on focus. It's called foveal vision. And that foveal vision doesn't mature until around eight years old. You can make a child do it, but it will cost them. It will stress them and tire them out. And Carla Hanover says, by seven or eight, as the frontal lobes of the brain mature, fine motor coordination of muscles throughout the body naturally develop. Before then, we have good peripheral and depth vision, but it's only when the frontal eye field of the frontal lobe matures that accurate enough eye teaming is possible for two-dimensional focus. Eye teaming occurs when the dominant eye tracks across the page of writing and the non-dominant eye follows the movements exactly and blends into binocular vision. So I bet most of us never really thought of reading as a motor skill. But it's the eye muscles that have to be mature enough to have the eyes track left to right together. It's the eye muscles that have to mature enough and the brain that has to mature enough to be able to move the muscles of the eye from seeing in the periphery to seeing on point, in focus, in the middle, that foveal vision on a two-dimensional flat piece of paper when they're living in the three-dimensional world. So one of the things that we find with young children is that if you can teach them this way, teach their listening skills first, teach their speech first, and you don't really have to hardly teach it. You just have to give them what the early childhood teachers in a Waldorf school gives them. It gives them rich, rich language soup, poetry, verses, singing, puppetry, drama, and storytelling. Not necessarily read aloud, so that's in there too. But in storytelling, there's no barrier between the one who's telling the story and the child. And you can just see the child, their jaw drops, and they're completely one with the story. And what's happening there is one of the most important things in learning to read. And that is that inwardly, in their mind's eye, they are visualizing everything the storyteller is saying. And if there's puppetry to help it along, if there's drama to help it along, if there's singing to help it along, and if there's movement to help it along, you'll see circle time in the early childhood and all the way up to third grade in the Waldorf School. Every story goes along with movement. So any theater person can tell you the way they learn lines is they walk the lines and that's how they learn it because there's something in the muscles that when you move the muscles it turns on the brain like this Carla Hannaford book that I should send around smart moves the body builds the brain learning's not all in your head it's in your body so the Waldorf early childhood classrooms are teaching reading the most important part of reading working with what children naturally do they work with visual imagery inside their own self. And if they're not watching visual imagery from Steven Spielberg and Walt Disney and whoever is producing SpongeBob, if they're not watching Minecraft, they can develop their own visual imagery because they want to, they love it. They love to express it through drama and through coloring and drawing and painting. So that's how the early childhood teaches reading. They work with the natural flow of the child, giving the child quality literature to listen to, teaching the children to speak big words beautifully. And in that way, not only do they develop visual imagery inside them that they can hold on to, they learn auditory discrimination. They learn to hear the parts of words. They learn to hear beginning and ending sounds. They don't know that's what they're doing. But if you give them this rich language and literature that our early childhoods give them, 
that's what they're getting. They're also learning, um, they're turning on the right-hand side of their brain, which controls the left side of their body. The right-hand side of the brain thinks in pictures, thinks, thinks three-dimensionally. They're also working the inner ear with the listening, which helps develop their balance, and their balance is helped along by the movement, which then improves listening. So speech, vision, auditory memory, visual memory, all of that is specifically taught in the early childhood. And most of us don't realize that when we go into a Waldorf classroom because it's so beautiful and we're lost in the beauty of the nature table, the beauty of the puppetry, the creativity of the colors around you. And yet, the language that's given to them in early childhood is richer than any initial kindergarten basal reader with a controlled vocabulary. Why limit the children to that? Plus, it turns out the International Reading Association, which is international, um, yeah, and it's a mainstream teachers organization. Every, I get the Reading Teacher magazine every single month, and every single month without fa fail, they're deploring the state of reading in the world. And they say, we, the children, they can decode their learning to word call, but they're not comprehending what they're word calling. What's wrong? Why can't they do it? The visual imagery is lost. And without visual imagery, there is no comprehension. That's not a Waldorf thing. That's just biology. So this is where we start in early childhood. Listening, speaking, this artistic expression, and reading comprehension. The hardest thing to learn to do in reading is comprehension, and that's where the kindergarten teachers begin, begin. In first grade, I can't do a thing without the early childhood teachers and without our Eurythmy teachers and our physical education teachers and our handwork teachers because they get the children moving and the body builds the brain. So once we get to the grades, then what do we do? How do we teach reading then? We lay the foundation in early childhood with reading comprehension, auditory discrimination, building up the muscles in the eye, trying, trying as best we can to help people understand why media is an obstacle to academic success. Because if you think about it, this inner visualization is relatively new in the history of humankind. It's done with the neocortex, this new part of the brain. But when you're watching an image on a screen, Joseph Chilton Pierce, who wrote Magical Child and Evolution End, and talks a lot about um, brain biology, he talks about when we watch a flat screen, it could be National Geographic all day, you're watching it with the same part of the brain that we share with the reptiles. And that's this back here. When we're doing this um, here, through puppetry, through singing, through movement, then you're developing visual imagery and you're seeing it inside yourself and that comes naturally to young children so when you want to teach reading why not use what comes naturally build on their visual imagery and then they'll have comprehension so in the grades then the next thing that we do is the important uh, concept there in grades is teaching from the whole to the parts so there's this idea, you've heard the word analysis, right? You'll take a big idea and you'll analyze it into its smaller parts and its smaller parts and its smaller parts, right? And then after a while, you want to take the smaller parts and synthesize them, put it back together. So analysis is taking something apart into its pieces. Synthesis is putting the pieces back together into its whole. So we work with analysis in the grades to start with before we synthesize it back together. When we work whole to parts, what was the most important thing here? Someone was listening to something spoken. Listening and speech was the most important part. And then there was a story, and the story was so wonderful that somebody wanted to record it. They wanted the meaning of the story to last forever. And so, 
They expressed it artistically, they invented alphabets, and they wrote it down because the meaning was so important. So in the grades, we start with a story and the meaning of the story because that's what a child wants. Give me something that means something. Meaning versus word calling. You know, when I was in college, I visited a friend of mine in law school. I'm a really good reader. I could read every word in that law book. I didn't have a single idea. I couldn't tell you what it said. Couldn't tell you what it meant. And for so many of our children, we, we start at the top of the pyramid and forget what's underwater and forget about meaning and story and the whole and the big picture. It's dry, it's dull, it's just simply mechanical decoding. What's the points of that? So we write first. We take a whole story, the teacher tells it, the children picture it inwardly. There's a beautiful drawing on the chalkboard to help the children along. They'll make their own drawings. After, the next day after I tell a story, then the children will tell the story back to me. And their memory is exceptional. Their sequencing is exceptional. First this happened, first that happened, then this, then this, and then there was this one and this one. Wait a minute, they left out that. That happened between this and this. And there is this lively discussion. Their memories are so strong, especially if they move a lot in their life. They go to playgrounds. The stronger is their body, the better is their memory. Memories related to body strength. In Walter Fland, you might see the term the etheric body. All that means is you're healthy and strong and you move a lot and your memory is strong as well. So the children tell me back the story. I collect everything they've said. I'll distill it and I'll write it out on the blackboard. Now I've been teaching them how to write the letters. Their words are on the blackboard. The next day, they will draw a picture in their book. And then the next day after that, they will write what I have written on the blackboard. And then the next day after that, they will read what they have written. Their motor skill, their motor activity was there in the writing, and their memories wrapped up with that. And so they put their hands underneath each word, and they read it back to me. And we sing and we memorize poems and songs and verses. And as we go through first grade and second grade, all those get written down. And then they start to read those, and they start to read those, and they start to read those. And they, Ms. Drews, when are we going to learn to read? And by then they've read at least 10 books that they themselves have written. You start with listening, speaking, the story, the artistic expression, and then the writing. That happens it's so easy, it's just there before you know it. But if you want to rush and start up there with reading and ignore the rest of it, it will be a struggle because there won't be good listening, there won't be auditory discrimination, the muscles of the eyes won't be mature enough to use foveal vision, they won't be able to picture it inwardly, and they will develop an antipathy to reading. And you don't want that to happen. So isn't it worth it to start this way? It might take a little longer, but suddenly when they get to reading, it happens so easily they don't even notice it has happened. And then the first thing they'll do is pick up a novel and read it. And back in the 70s and 80s, it was also called the language experience approach. And a lot of people thought you had to choose between language experience and phonics. But in a Waldorf school, it's never an either or. They can do choir and chemistry. They can have language experience and phonics because what you take apart from the whole, you have to put back together again, right? What goes up must come down, right? So writing comes first. Meaning's more important than word calling. We do this synthesis, take it apart. We call on their memory. We call on their speech to be able to retell what they have recalled. They read their own writing, they draw about it, and then we have to put it back together again. Do you ever have a child take something at home apart and you've got pieces all over the floor? All right, this is the part where most Americans start teaching reading. Let's just work with the little pieces. Let's work with the consonants and the vowels and the grammar and the syntax and the sound symbol relationships, the word analysis skills, the decoding, all the specific skills and mechanics of English usage, which you have to have. You can't just analyze all the time and spread parts all over the ground and never put it back together again. 
Well, we also in the grades go both ways. We teach phonics, we teach grammar, we teach decoding, we teach sound symbol relationships, we teach spelling. But that comes up right around up here. It comes in with writing. And that's all these skills. Because once, when, you, when you put language to sleep with writing, well, it's like the prince who has to come along and kiss the princess to wake her up. So all this reading comprehension and storytelling, once you take the whole and take it apart, you want to wake it up again, and reading wakes up the writing. In the first grade, second grade, third grade, we're learning to read. We're taking our time. We're building a solid foundation. This isn't ragu. This is your great grandma's spaghetti sauce recipe. It's going to cook all day long. Okay. And another analogy I like to use, I lived in Southern California for a long time where strawberry season was in January and February. So which farmers took the best crop to market? The farmers that said when the frost is coming, well, tough luck, we have to get out there and sell those strawberries. We need to bring it a good test score. And they don't bother covering up their strawberries. But then there's the other farmer who says, I'm going to cover up my strawberries. I don't care if we don't get to market that day. We get a terrible test score. But eventually, who's going to bring the healthier strawberries to market? The farmer who covered their strawberries up. So it's the same kind of thing in Waldorf School. It goes a little slower because we're working on all this. So what is reading exactly? It's spoken language. It's written language. It's working with the oral tradition versus using basal textbooks with limited vocabulary. And you guys had it. Gestures, questions, smiling, cooing, crying, inflection, tone, warmth, emotion, body language. If that's not in the reading instruction, antipathy to reading will develop. Because we're not human if we don't have those things. See what good reading teachers you all are? But we, we kind of squish what we know because we're in such a rush to go to the top of the pyramid. Um, all right, let me show you some pictures here about how once we've taken the whole, the story, we tell it, rewrite it, we read it back, we've taken it down into all its little parts. How do we go back to the beginning? How do we take all the little parts and put them back together? And by the little parts, I mean the phonics, the spelling, the grammar, the syntax, the writing. We start with a story. So here's bear skin. There's the story of a bear. Out of the bear comes the shape of the bee. Some teachers will use a butterfly. Some teachers will use um, yeah, a bee, a bumblebee. What letter do you suppose comes out of that? A D. And then there's a whole dragon story. Okay, so. We tell the story, we put the picture. One of the things in a Waldorf school that we want is that the children engage in real life, real actual things in the world. There are bears, there are dragons, and lots of stories that you hear everywhere. And then one of the next things we'll do is we'll brainstorm. This must be a T page for the sound of T. And here's something really important, families. I tell the children, the letters don't make sounds. The human being makes the sound. There's no letter that sounds t. I make the sound t. And when I want to write the sound t, my symbol for that is the letter t. So that's the sound symbol relationship. I go t. And if I want to write it down in a word instead of a picture, I've chosen the letter t which is kind of, it's not really an arbitrary picture. So here's some more, t train, turkey, etc. The children love this because they're in the three-dimensional world, turtle, teacup, and they're calling out these words. They can't wait for it to be sketched on the blackboard. And here's more l words. So here again, we're working with initial consonant sounds. We work with consonants first because they're really earthly sounds. The k, the d. And we'll often introduce the letters in the order of how they're produced in our mouth. 
So see, it looks, it's so pretty, we're not teaching reading, but look how much thought is going behind what we're doing in the classroom. This is all reading. But initial consonants are taught artistically with things from the real world. So here's our farmer holding his lantern. And they can't wait. They come and, I know what letter we're learning today. All right, here's our L. This is one of my favorites, the Nixie on the Mill Pond. What letter do you suppose is coming out of that story? The letter N. And then we'll brainstorm that, and then we'll have zillions of words with each one of the consonants, and we'll make little booklets, and I can show you. So here we'll do that. And that is how we learn to write the forms of the letters, the symbols that match the sounds. So now we're starting to synthesize. We're taking the symbol that came from a, a thing that's real in the story, and we're learning how to write now. So they're learning how to make these, but when they do it, they know that that M comes from the shape of the mountain, the B comes from the shape of the bear, the P came from the pot of the porridge, the D came from the dragon, the T came from a tree. I bet you know what that one is. The valley. Even the children who come in and they know by rote, A, B, C, D, F, you know, they don't know what they're singing. Even the ones who come in and they're reading, they're decoding already, this is so rich for them. The artistic expression and the story and the vocabulary. What letter do you suppose comes out of this? The W for the wave. The F out of the fish. Here's our V in the valley. This is an interesting one, the sound of k. Now we start to get into the nitty-gritty of English spelling. One sound can be represented by several symbols. It's so easy to learn this way. When we make our k booklets, we have a zillion pictures. Some of them start with K, and I might put that in one color. Some of them start with a cat sound, and some of them might start with the sound of the queen, whose umbrella always goes with her. And there's a whole story about why she has an umbrella, and there's a whole story about the king who needs to go to his counselor, the cat, because of all these other k things that are happening to him. But they draw this in their main lesson book. So we go through all the consonants that way. And then we get to the end of the consonants, and there they are. Wait a minute, Miss Truce, that doesn't say anything. <laughs> Something's wrong here. Ah, there are more letters. And these are not so earthly, these letters. These, earth, these letters really do represent feelings. The feeling of surprise, the feeling of wonder, the feeling of fear. The feeling of, oh, let me hold you. The feeling of, ooh, the vowel sounds. And then there are the pure vowel sounds. And then there's the everyday workaday vowel sounds, like the one that you hear in Apple. So here we go. Here's a little story for E. We see each B buzzing in the green tree, please give me honey for my sweet tea. And then there's a story about the prince who is an I. And, and, um, and then again, they're putting that in their book. The unicorn for you, the king sitting on his, the, the king on his throne of gold, and the gnomes who know a secret that's so old. And, but then, see, so we're working on auditory discrimination and pronunciation. Then we're going to draw it. We're taking those parts that we took apart from the whole, and now we're going to learn to put them back together in writing. Now, here's a first grade rhyme. We do s as many in, as they do in kindergarten, learning songs and rhymes and verses. They know them by heart. They write them in their book. They know this. They can say it with their eyes closed. In the heart of a seed, very deep, so deep, a dear little plant lay fast asleep. Wake, said the sun, and creep to the light. The little plant heard. So they, they know this. They're writing it. They're reading it. Then, this is first grade. Now I'll start with a letter A. But one of the things we'll do as we want to put the parts back, you know, work with the parts instead of the whole now, we'll work the vowel sound. So I was happening to work with the sound of O. Now a lot of teachers will start after the consonants, after the vowels, and they'll go right away to rhyming words, ball, call, fall. I don't start there. Because hearing ending sounds that are all alike, 
If you don't have good auditory discrimination, you can get away with so much because it all sounds alike. But how do we develop that auditory discrimination with the ending sound? Let's make the beginning sound all the same and change the ending sound. Then they really have to listen. So I'll start. Let's see if I can have a simpler one. Nope, not a simpler one. I'll start with just the C O. And we'll go through the whole alphabet. Let's put B at the end of Ka. What do you get? Quarter of the cob, cob. Let's put what else? Let's A, B, C, D, D, cod, cod. Oh, and then my little fisherman will say, cod, a codfish. Cog. And then my mechanic will say, oh, it's a cog in a wheel. And then my phlegmatic child who just wants to take a nap and have lunch will say, cot. <laughs> you know? And we're thinking of all these things too. And so I'll just go through the alphabet really methodically, really simple, systematically. Every single vowel through every single initial consonant. And then they're all on the board. And then in a few minutes, I'll show you the pictures that they draw out of these. Because then they start to come to, they ha then they have to draw. Well, we're going to draw an O book. These words are on the board. Draw whichever ones you want. Ms. Jones, I want to draw a rock. Which one up there says rock? I'm not going to tell them. You can read it. What do you hear when you say, the first thing out of your mouth when you say rock? Er, what letter stands for the sound of er? R. Go up there and, and point to the R column. And they run up and they point. But Ms. Jones, which one is rock? Well, say rock. Rock. What do you hear? When you're finished saying rock, I hear k. What did we say? What letters stand for the sound k? Oh, I know, the king and his counselor. Oh, wait a minute, it's that one, R-O-C-K. See you, Mr. And they run back to their table to draw it and write it. Good work. You read that all by yourself. I did? I did. And then you can just see the neurons firing. And they're so excited. And suddenly they go up to the board, and there's all sorts of movement in the class. They're going back and forth. And there's no ditto papers. There's no pencils. It's just crayon and these colorful things on the board. And wait till I show you what they've written. Um, so this is another example of things they'll put in their vowels book. This is first grade. This is all first grade. Does anybody say we don't teach reading in a Boulder school? If they say that to you, just smile and go, you poor misinformed person. <laughs> and now this is a little more typical. Then we finally do get to rhyming words. You know, big pig wig. But again, we call on their visual imagery, their inner imagination, and we tell stories. So I'll sit there and I'll tell a story about my dog. This is actually a true story. And we had a pool in the backyard, and he was just a little puppy. And he went into the back walk, 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 walk. And Walk straight into the pool. <laughs> he didn't know it wasn't solid. <laughs> and he got a lot of water into him. He was fine, but I said we had to take him to the vet. We had to take the wet pet to the vet. And in that moment, I couldn't myself think how to draw it. Half the time, I can't think how to draw the things. The children will say, well, let's draw it this way. And I'm like, all right, raise your hand if you know how to draw that. Six of them will have fabulous ideas of how to draw it that I never had because I didn't go to Walder School. I went to New York City Public Schools where I, I read at four years old. My eyes are still messed up and <laughs> I've really had to work hard to develop inner visualization, <laughs> not to mention draw. But the kids, so they're telling me, let's draw that, let's draw that. And then they're telling me what to draw and I'm putting it on there. And what they draw in their main lesson books is a hundred times better than this. And then they love this one. This was the circle time one. Mr. And we did it with bean bags, passing them around. Mr. Knox keeps his socks in a pale pink chocolate box. Orange socks with spots and clocks. Oh, you dandy Mr. Knox. <laughs> and we'd say it over and over and over. This is on the board. And even the children whose foveal vision isn't developed yet, whose small muscle motor coordination isn't developed yet, those children are so into the rhythm of that that they know it by heart, and they're up there going, Mr. Knox. And then I'll call them to the board, and I'll have them read it aloud, and then I'll have small groups, and we'll take out their main lesson books that are, you know, at least two of them with verses like this. And that's where the interventionists here will come in. We'll take their books, and they'll practice reading. They'll sit down and read it to each other, and they so enjoy it because it's so invested with visual imagery and laughter. And then we're back practicing 
those little small parts, putting them back into a hole again. Bag, big, big, bog, bug. I didn't get any of this out of any program. You know, I had to learn, you know, you as a reading teacher, you had to know your stuff. You don't want to say, oh, well, on Tuesday, I'm going to go to page 37 of the Scott Forsman language arts book that the school district says I have to use on Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Then I'm just a delivery system, and they're not going to connect to it. But if I really get it, and I know how it works, and I'm jazzed about it, and I've got a story, and they're engaged, they're, they're, they love this. They, and they're not all as beautiful as this. Some are better handwriting, some are, le are beautiful. and s You get all levels, of, di but they, they're into it. They're so into it. And that's what you want. You want them to be engaged in it. Get the wet pet to the vet. Here's Mr. Knox. Here's th these are children's work. Can I, this is all first grade. This is all first grade. Do you follow the words with the finger? With the I do. Yes, indeed. I have them follow their words with the finger and the right hand, unless I know for sure that they're really left eyed, left handed, left foot, and left eared. And I'm told that it's really only a doctor who can diagnose that sort of thing. But um, anyway, with the right hand, because it helps the eye tracking. Even with older children, I do that to help them with the eye tracking. But you remember we were on the vowel page and we had all the words on the board? Well, fold your page into four parts and draw whatever you want from what's on the board and they go to town. Can I put two words in a box? Why, yes, you can. <laughs> can I write a whole story? <laughs> Why, yes, you can. And some, so here's one, look, I've got suds in the tub, and there's my duck. And I'm going to tuck the little girl into bed and give her a back rub. So, and there's a, here's more of these things. So this is another verse that they memorize and draw a picture. Spring is coming, there's the king. Oh, so this is the children's work. So you, what you were seeing before is mine. But the children learn to draw it. This is done with the block crayons. And here's another one sideways, of course. So what, what vowel is this one about? Short E, right? Short E. And I call the, sh the short vowels. I say the grown-ups call them short vowels, but we can also call them the workaday vowels. They're, they're not the, the long, their true name. A, E, I, O, and U are the true names of those letters and their sound that the letters that those long vowels stand for is also A, E, I, O, U. How about that? But the workaday names, their nicknames are a, e, i, a, uk, a. So I fell in the well, my pet fell in the well, help! A red gem, I fed the pet, a pen. So there's my igloo for a long eye. I like this one. The light shines high in the sky, it gives life and sight. A little of the light am I. And so they're writing that. This is all first grade, that's first grade. Around second grade, we start working with the digraphs now. So can you tell what initial sounds these drawings represent? If you say the name of the picture, the first thing that your mouth says is the sound. Sh for shirt. Sh for shoe. F, 13. Pull for plow. There's a blend in there with the digraph. Ch for chicken. So here's a TH. The unvoiced th, and then there's also the voiced th, and we make that distinction as well. So here are some booklets. So we made a booklet for ch, we made a booklet for th, we made a booklet for wa, we made a booklet for sh. The same way we made a booklet for a, e, i, a, and uh. Same way we made a booklet for k, p, d, t, u, m, j. They're making their own textbooks. You don't need all this stuff. But think about how, this is second grade. Think about all this that we went through, starting in early childhood. Early childhood and first grade, they're working from whole to parts. They're working with comprehension and inner visualization. They're working with feeling and joy and movement. It's not till second and third grade we start taking those pieces the digraphs, the blends, the rhyming words, the diphthongs, the long and short vowels. You don't need that 
until, in fact, it's, it's counterproductive to bring that before you bring the comprehension. So when in a Walder school, we teach from whole to parts first. And then we go from parts to whole with the spelling and the phonics and grammar and mechanics of English usage. How weird is it when you go to test in kindergarten for grammar and phonics? It's backwards. It makes no sense. It doesn't even correspond with the biology of the physiological neurology of child development. And then we think, oh, their, that school, their kindergarten scores tanked. They must not teach reading. Oh my gosh, nothing could be further from the truth. We are teaching the most important elements of reading in early childhood and first grade. But we don't know enough to test for comprehension in kindergarten. And how would you do it anyway? How would you do it anyway? We do teach reading. And we teach it deeply and broadly. And we take our time with it. And we fully engage the children. And we do it artistically. Not because we want them to be artists but because that's where they are in childhood with this visual imagery. That is what draws them. They like that. So here they are. You know, this child's going on and on. I love this one. I take a shower, I put shampoo on, and the door shattered in its really sharp pieces. I put on my shirt and my short and my shoes, and I shear the sheep <laughs> because all these words were on the board. And did you notice, I don't have pictures on the board anymore, just the words. Suddenly, I've moved away. I've moved away from the artistic expression. I've moved away into the alphabet and the writing. And now they have to supply the picture and write it themselves, with the capital in the right place and a period. So it's because you need it. No one could read it if you didn't use the proper mechanics of English usage. And is that dull and dry and boring? Oh my goodness, no. Can I see her work? Can I write that sentence too? Look at my sentence. And then we got really into it. And then I, you know, I'm so grateful we have all these blackboards because ch -ch 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 -ch. we went to town with the chow. I couldn't write fast enough. Mr. I want to write about cheddar cheese in my chowder and I want chips with it. Where is it up there? Well, come on, you find it for me. At this point, I don't tell them anything. They want to know what word that is. And then they go back and they spell it for themselves. There's no more reversals at this point. And then, and these are, this was second grade now. This was probably early second grade. And they're not sideways, so yeah, we're in a good one. And they share. So one little boy, Andres will go, Addison, help me draw a chipmunk. I can't draw a chipmunk. And she'll, you know, they'll teach each other how to draw a chipmunk because, like, I'm not, I hope by next year I can draw a chipmunk, but I like, th these are great, these are great. And these are just your average, ordinary kids. Now, here, there's, now, again, you're going to have a range, you're going to have the ones who want to write the long novels, and you're going to have the ones for whom writing one or two words is where they're at. <laughs> and, then, and now, but look at the sequence, now we're starting to sequence. And then by the end of second grade and into third grade, they're into the sequencing thing. And now we'll have pages and pages with this happened first, this happened second, this happened third, this happened fourth, fifth and sixth and seventh. And there's a little, you know, now suddenly we're, we're into the preparation for writing of reports. What's the first thing? What's the second thing? What's the third thing? What are the details? What's the topic sentence? So this is all, I as a teacher am looking ahead to when they're starting to do research reports, which start in fourth grade. So I want to show you some more second grade stuff. And the blue and the yellow and the red, the, so, that is, so now when we're finally getting to lowercase, the capital letters take, go from the sky, the top, the top two lines. Then there's letters that only take the middle line. And then there's letters that dig down into the brown earth. And those, that's the G. So and this is, this is a student's work. And this comes from the, um, the fables that come in second grade. Do they draw the earth in the second Yeah. So I, uh, and, I, and I'll vary colors, but when I first start, I'm really careful. The blue sky, the golden sandbox, and the dark brown earth. And the capital letters come from the sky into the golden sandbox. And here's another really important thing I do with the children. From the stars to the stones. If your children are writing bottom up, stop them. 
we go from top down, every single letter, top down. Same thing with the numbers, top down. Don't let them do it from the bottom up. Don't let them do it right to left because we read top down and left right. You always want to train the hand and eye, top down, left to right. So then I get bored with those three colors and I just start flipping the colors around. But they know by now, G is a digging letter, T is a tall letter, L is a tall letter, and now we are lowercase. And their handwriting is so, so beautiful. Just beautiful. Okay, all right, this is fun. Here's some grammar stuff. So of course we do teach you know, we teach spelling, we teach grammar, mechanics of capitalization and punctuation and adverbs and adjectives and verbs and nouns starting in second grade and then all the way through eighth grade at increasingly complex levels. And I made this one up because you can tell somebody was whining in my class. <laughs> and I didn't want to really just, I didn't, you know, you, sometimes with certain children you can't address it directly. But certain children knew who I was talking about. Um, I start teaching cursive at the end of second grade. I do. Do other, you know, some teachers wait till third grade. But I find that I want them while they're still into this. I want to write, I want to write, I want to write. Cursive is so much easier in a certain way than printing, and I want them to have the flexibility of both. So I always start in second grade, usually after Christmas. And it's such a big deal for them to do cursive, like the grown-ups. And lowercase, did you say that you get Upper and lowercase. So upper and lowercase. And so, so this is a big debate for me. In teaching in a Walder, I always have taught in independent Walder schools. Mm -hmm. All through first grade, I just, just uppercase. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm doing in here. First week in second grade, here's the lowercase letters. I don't make a big fuss, not a lot of stories, not a lot of drawings. Here's the R, here's this, here's this, here's this. Here's when you use them, here's when you don't use them. And you go into all those mechanics. Right on, beginning of second grade. And then after Christmas, I'll start with cursive so that by the after second grade, they can print and write in cursive, uppercase and lowercase. That's me. Every teacher is different. Oh, here's something. So we had a reading group in third grade with Little House on the Prairie, Farmer Boy. In third grade, we were reading Farmer Boy. And I had a very phlegmatic class. They just wanted to sit and eat. So they went through donuts, apple cider. Oh, the food in Farmer Boy is so amazing. So they made this list. They sat there and they made this list. And one little girl parsed it out. OK, Harrison, your mom's going to make the bread. OK, Anders, your mom's bringing the this. OK, so-and-so, your mom's bringing that. So-and-so, your mom's bringing that. And we had a, farm, a Farmer Boy feast for reading. And the ones who were having difficulty reading that book, you bet they read their little hearts out because they wanted to find the food they wanted. So this is some sixth and seventh and eighth grade stuff. Working with grammar. And in the older grades, their main lesson books are going to have a table of contents. This is, oh, this is fifth grade, the lily and the rose, botany. So how, could, how do we not teach reading when we're doing botany and ancient history. You know, how, how can that picture of the wizard be remotely related to this composition about New England, which by then is their own words? They're not copying the teacher's words off the board anymore. They're turning in a rough draft. They're learning how to proofread. They're learning how to edit. From there, we start there, and we end up there. I mean, it's just astonishing, you know, just in summary. We work from whole to parts. We work with all four, all four basic language arts. We actually teach it. Speech, hearing, listening and speaking. Then artistic expression as a medium, not necessarily as an end in itself. Then writing. And out of that, we finally break through the water. And then comes reading. Everything has to have meaning. It's a story that has to be worth telling. It has a story that has to be worth reading. And if you look at the books that we have on the tables in the back, and we have 
thousands of the best of children's literature in our libraries and teachers' professional resource up in Christy Smith's office. They read the best literature here. It's exceptional, exceptional work. Um, but they have to care about it. So we teach to multiple intelligences through movement, through speech, auditory, visual. There's a dancer's intelligence. There's the athlete's intelligence. There's the empath's intelligence. We do it through using all of the senses, so it's multi-sensory, and we want to integrate those senses. So each sense informs the other's sense. And we engage their emotions. We engage their smiles, their cooing, their crying, their questions. This comprehension is our foundation and also our aim. The inner aspect of reading, you know, decoding, that's the outer aspect. That's the mechanics. You have to have that. But you don't want just word calling. The inner aspect of reading, the life of the imagination, which is the ultimate ground of thought and the goal of literature remains vibrant and the love of language and the thirst for stories flourishes. And that's what we're after with the way we teach reading in a Waldorf school. We want them to have that inner visualization and imagination, not for fantasy, oh, the pig can fly, but we want them to grow up and be able to know what lives behind the Declaration of Independence, what lives behind E equals MC squared, what lives behind calculus, what lives behind the westward expansion across the continent of North America? What was that about? What was the Russian and French Revolution about? What's going on today? All over the world, the northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, what are those relationships there? We want them to live into it and care about it. And so we go after this imagination, this passion, this emotional engagement through the way we teach reading. And if you ever talk to a Waldorf School graduate, you'll hear their questions, you'll hear their passion, you'll hear their engagement in life. They don't care about the zombie apocalypse. They want to know about life. Life. And that's what we want for your children. That's why you're all here. So these articles are over there. This one by, by Barbara Sokolov. There's more to reading than meets the eye, which she says in three pages what it took me just two hours to say. She's really good. And then the other one that's over there is the one by Dr. Susan Johnson, who is the pediatrician in Colfax. And it comes from a website that's free with lots of information about the medical aspects and developmental aspects of reading and writing and spelling. So it's called Teaching Our Children to Read, Write, and Spell by Susan Johnson. And she's got a great website. I, um, encourage you to go to it. So there and other goodies are over there for you. And thank you all for coming out on a Wednesday night like this when your children are at home. I'm really grateful. And thank you for making this wonderful Mountain Phoenix community. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.